Sexual trauma is so pervasive. Many of us have it. And a majority of us that have it have not had uh, an assault or a violent situation, which makes sexual trauma highly under or misdiagnosed and uh, leaves us a bit confused as to why we feel the way we feel. Trauma is an overwhelm in the nervous system as a result of perceived or actual threat. This means any word that goes before the word trauma just means that's the event that caused the overwhelm. Trauma is not dependent on abuse, and sexual trauma is no different. Sexual trauma is an overwhelm that involves your sexual organs, your perception around sex, your sexuality, or any sexual experience or situation where your body is experiencing sexuality. Common forms of sexual trauma that do not include abuse are exposure to porn, especially before puberty. And when I say exposure, I mean accidentally finding it or looking through the door and seeing someone else watch it or hearing it. Medical procedures like circumcision, hysterectomies, and breast surgeries. Cancers in any of the sexual organs. Being bullied for your penis size or for small or large breasts from your peers. Having sex or being sexual when you don't want to, even with someone who is safe and loving. This is called sexual fawning, and I'm going to also talk about that in a few minutes. It's experiencing shame or confusion around your sexuality. This could be true for straight people, gay, asexual, bisexual, like me, trans, non-binary, many different identities and ways of being in the world that aren't the, the norm can cause an experience of shame and confusion, which can actually build into a, a sexual trauma in and of itself. Infertility treatments can be extremely traumatic. Birth trauma, abortion, miscarriages, gynecological exams, that's a big one, mammograms. So these are just some things, I'm sure many of you are kind of you know, yelling out at the phone or whatever you're listening to, like, oh, with this, don't forget this, Luis, and, and you're right. So say it out loud, say it for yourself so you can kind of identify this experience kind of created a, a trauma around my sex, my sexuality, my sexual expression. So many of us feel unsafe sexually. We feel invaded or we even feel broken sexually, and we go looking for proof we spend years and years in therapy trying to find or create a memory that validates our fragile experiences around sex, that validates why we have the sexuality we have, why we have the kinks we have even. There's the question, how can I heal if I cannot remember? With this work that I do, remembering isn't, isn't necessary for healing or for validating. The feelings the expressions, the sensations in your body, that is your proof. That is valid. That's what you're working with. If you discover a reason, if you discover an event, great. You have something to kind of connect to the expression you're experiencing. But we don't need to find the event. For me personally, when I found the events that I had blacked out that made a lot of sense around my sexual issues, I didn't get better. I actually got worse. I, I had more PTSD, more insomnia, more flashbacks, more anxiety. So it's not always true that figuring it out is going to heal us. It doesn't. It orients us to a past that makes sense about our present. And that can be temporarily soothing or validating. So I'm not discrediting you know, the desire or the, the result of figuring something out that maybe you weren't aware of. Still, that past event is still in the body now. And that's what we're working with somatically with trauma healing. The body stores trauma when it cannot complete a trauma response. Something you saw, something you heard, even something you imagined can be at the root of this. And it's not your fault. This is our human experience. What we want to do is sit with what's there. Don't make it wait for us to find the cause. We just want to nurture it, witness it, and ask it what it wants. See what happens when you listen to the sensations around sexual trauma in your body. That's how we begin to heal. We feel those clenched parts and we give them space to be felt and held. 
anyone listening, we're going to do a little exercise in a moment, but I'm also going to orient you to a past episode, episode 10. It's a finding safety in yourself exercise, and it's a very extensive meditation, and there's an explanation before and after. And it's a great exercise to do after this episode, once maybe something has come up inside of you, or you've identified something new. Before I go into it, I want to go to sexual fawning, because sexual fawning, in my experience, tends to be the greatest source of sexual trauma. And it's so hard to understand why. And it's so hard to even know that you're doing it because we tend to do it with people we love and feel safe with, right? When we fawn by having sex, we experience sexual trauma. Fawning sexually is much more common than we think. To understand it, we have to remind ourselves of what the fawning mechanism is. It's people pleasing in response to threat or anxiety. In this case, threat or anxiety might be someone leaving you because you're not having sex with them, or it might be someone being upset or disappointed. Sexual fawning means having sex, being sexual, or using your sexuality in response to threat or anxiety, as well as in response to wanting uh, to secure an attachment to someone. Because an insecure attachment or lacking attachment with someone can feel like a threat in the body to some of us based on our childhood situations. So sometimes it involves actual threat. It could be our boss, a first date, or a stranger. Someone can be forcing us verbally, threatening us, or even suggesting they want to be sexual with us. It can also happen in in the case of uh, an assault or a rape. Out of fear or out of the need to save our lives, we don't fight them off or say no. We allow, we might even pretend we're into it. We know that allowing it means we can survive literally or socially, which feel identical to the body. Uh, Those literal socials, they feel identical to the body. Whether it's I'm surviving to keep my job, I'm surviving in this relationship, or I'm surviving with my life, the body feels that all as a, a desire, a sense of survival and need. This is a proper response to threat and fear. This is why fawning exists in the first place. It saves us from possible threat from other people. Yet, it can leave us confused and feeling shame, guilt, and judgment that is our fault. Why didn't I say anything? Why didn't I say no? Why didn't I fight back? We hear it all the time on the stands when someone is taking um, a position in court. And they say, why didn't you fight them off? If we're trauma-informed and we understand the mechanism of fawning and how it automatically turns on, we would never ask those questions. Other times, so we're talking about threat here, other times there's no actual threat present in terms of the other person threatening you. It can be your beloved of 30 years and you don't want to hurt them by saying no, so you have sex when you don't want to. It might be your entire relationship with this person from the first time you made love to the other day. You've never really known when you desire it. You just give it when they want it. Other times it can be expressed more dominantly through wildly flirting, using your body sexually to feel safe and in control of conversations and situations, even creating like archetypes if you're a performer or someone that uses your sexuality to make money, right? Every time we fawn sexually, we break our own boundaries. Even when there's a threat present, we still break our boundaries in hopes of survival. It's innocent, and it's not our faults. This isn't a place to blame, and it's not to place blame. It's to bring clarity as to what's left in our bodies after these experiences. Our sex organs and other parts of our bodies begin to constrict to protect themselves. And since fawning can even trick us into thinking we like something, it can go unnoticed for decades. It can even become part of your personality or or preferred way of having sex. It can become your kink. Nothing wrong with that if you're aware it's your kink, right? If you're not, then you're kind of being unconsciously moved by it and breaking a boundary unconsciously. One way to notice this is if you feel depleted after a sexual experience or enlivened. Do you feel embodied after a sexual experience or dissociated? Do you feel constricted or expanded? Do you feel safe and centered or threatened and a bit out of your body? 
how your body responds to arousal and sexual connection, especially with another person, will teach you if there's a trauma response overcoupled with your sexual energy. Now, if you haven't heard my work about fawning or my, my philosophy and how I see it, you can go to episode two. There's a lot of information there. I even have a webinar on my website that you can buy and watch and own. Uh, it's a replay that goes deep into the fawning mechanism. Sexual fawning is just one little branch of that. And I'm bringing that into this conversation because it's a major source of sexual trauma. Because again, sexual trauma is a boundary violation that somehow relates to your sexuality, your body, your sex organs in a sexual matter. So what I find important here is to understand somatically how this shows up, okay? There's this term overcoupled. You may be aware of it. If not, it simply means associating something with a certain sensation or meaning. So if I have, let's say I have a history uh, well, okay, I have a history of um, traumatic sexual experiences with men. That's my history as Luis. So I have mostly gone now, but for many years, I had 10, 20 years probably, I had an overcoupling that men equal threat, specifically straight white men, because that's who I experienced threat with. So when I would see them, my body would respond. And I'm not even talking about seeing them in a sexual way, sitting in a room with them, going to college with them, going into a gas station. Those were especially terrifying for me. My body would immediately start reacting to this demographic, these individuals part of this demographic that reminded my body of past experiences. That's an overcoupling. So through the lens of trauma, an overcoupling really means my body experiences this thing as a threat based on past situations. It doesn't mean that you're not, that you're not right. Sometimes we will experience something as a threat from an overcoupling, from a past experience, and at the same time, it's actually a real life threat in that moment. These are, there's nuances to this somatically that we learn the more we do this work. That's why I can't recommend my six-week course enough because it will really teach you that part what's important here is to understand that when we have sexual trauma our sex is overcoupled with threat which means physically we have an automatic response of defense so that means our arousal that means someone touching us that means our own fantasies that could even mean looking touching or feeling our own sexual organs or parts of our bodies a physiological defense turns on. And what that means for the body is constriction. It means the muscles start to get tighter, the ligaments start to get tighter, all to pull the bones in, to pull. And if you saw, see me right now, I'd be curling my shoulders, putting my, making fists, crossing my arms over my chest, protecting my body, right? It's as if someone's throwing something at you and you would naturally wince to protect yourself. That's what's happening somatically when we have sexual trauma. And because most of our trauma responses are completely disembodied, meaning they're happening and we don't even know they're happening, we're, we're numb to those, those uh, delicate, small gestures that occur in our system, which sometimes are visceral, like at the organ level, and other times are postural, all the way to the bones, right? And how we're holding ourselves physically and visually. What does that mean? That means if I have sexual trauma and I'm going to have sex with someone, but I'm not aware of my sexual trauma, even someone who's amazing, that act of sex can then become traumatic, right? Because if, it, let's say, um, especially the kind of sex you're having and the biology you're having your sex with. So everyone listening to this has a different biology. There's going to be female-bodied people. It's going to be male-bodied people. It's going to be intersex people. It's going to be transgenders. Everyone's going to have a different non-binary, but biologically speaking, we're going to have a different biology of how we have sex. If we receive someone into our bodies, if we are going into someone else's body, 
if we don't receive or go in and we're just touching or using our mouths or rubbing our bodies or using our eyes, there's different ways we all have sexual connection. And, or unless you're asexual, and that's a whole other thing we're going to talk about in another episode. But what I find important about this is if we have unprocessed unconscious sexual trauma, every time we feel arousal, the body goes into that defensive response physically even though mentally you have a major desire for this person in front of you. So when you leave this experience of having sex with somebody or having a sexual experience, it doesn't even have to be penetration or intercourse. It doesn't even have to lead to orgasm. It could be sensually kissing or even holding. It could be just eye contact. Anything that starts to become sensual is also activating. Think about when you're turned on. Think about when you're in love. It's quite activating, isn't it? Our blood pressures rise. Our heartbeat increases. As I'm talking about it, my breath is even getting shallow, right? Sex is inherently activating. It's a build up to have a kind of like explosive, expansive, uh, you know, orgasmic climax to bring forth life or joy or pleasure or ecstasy, right? It's an activating experience. That means those of us with sexual trauma, we want to understand stored trauma is almost like a buried landmine that you forgot about. And when the body gets activated, it turns on that landmine. So the activation, the healthy activation that comes from a sexual experience when you're sexually traumatized can also turn on sexual trauma, can bring forth flashbacks, can bring forth somatic memory, which means the mind isn't seeing it, but the body's feeling it. This is why we can have really safe, wonderful sexual experiences on paper, but the body afterwards doesn't feel it. A lot of female-bodied people I've worked with will get UTIs. That's one way their body's saying no. Vaginal pain or rubbing or not getting wet. That's the body saying no. Men feeling extreme shame after ejaculation, that's the body saying, I didn't want that. And I have to put a pin there. Anyone listening to this with a penis knows that sometimes you will get an erection because of activation. And I've had some profound sessions with men who were self-proclaimed sex addicts. And what I learned with them, what they learned with them, was fear actually drove them to a physical state of arousal, which then they overcoupled with sex. A situation that scared them created an erection. So biologically, they were turned on. Biologically, they could come, they could have orgasm, they could ejaculate. Physiologically, deep inside of them, and emotionally, there was a ton of fear. There was a constriction. And then afterwards, they were left with extreme guilt and shame and dysregulation, which then they went to get more sex to try to regulate, and it becomes this vicious cycle. So we really want to get nuanced here and understand sex in a new way. Nothing's wrong here. This is just what happens in our bodies when the body is confused and has overcoupled trauma with sex. I want to pause and ask everyone to just check their bodies right now. If you're in a safe place where you can do that, go for it. If not, listen later. As I'm talking about this, what's beautiful about somatic work is you can start feeling it as someone's speaking it. Notice in your body right now, when you think about having sex or you think about sexual experiences, what comes up? Where do you you feel turned on? How does your body relate to your turn on? Where do you feel turned off? Where do you feel a block? Where do you feel disgust or joy or constriction or peace? Just notice what your body does and what parts of your body feel that, how parts of your body work with that. Some of us might feel turned on in our chest, but our genitals get constricted. Or our genitals get turned on and our stomach gets constricted. Understanding this gives you a little more uh, awareness and validation around why you feel so bad after you have sex with someone you love so much. 
It could be a sexual fawning experience, or it could be that your body is being reminded of violation in the past related to sexuality. Even when I say sexual trauma, it doesn't even mean pleasure. I can't tell you the amount of women and people with vaginas who have come through my door and come into my courses and and share how traumatized they are from gynecological exams, from the whether, whether it was the doctor's manner, bedside manner, or the instruments being used. It led to a major constriction and it made it very hard for them to enjoy sex afterwards. So you can go to the doctor to get even life-saving uh, medical interventions and you can still emerge with a sexual trauma because there's a trauma around the sexual organ now. So I'm saying this example so we can understand it's not just about sexual experiences. It's also about overwhelming experiences, violating experiences or painful experiences related to the sexual organs or parts of the body that feel the, the arousal or the charge of sexuality. So let's all just notice again, I said earlier that I would direct you to episode 10. Really notice in your body right now how it feels when you think of this. What comes up? Where do you notice in your mind and or in your body? When I think about sex, when I have sex, when I want sex, when I have a memory in the past with a certain person or this doctor or this situation, where do I still feel my body constricting? And where does that constriction intersect my sexuality and my sexual experiences? Asking this question, this simple question and sitting with it can really start to change your life. And once you feel in your body where that is and you really located it, write it down. I feel a constriction in my pelvis. I feel nausea in my gut when I get a, a heart on. I feel a tension in my back when I even think about my, my sexual organs or having sex. Just notice these overcoupled sensations or meanings or states that are negative or painful in response to sex or sexuality. I'm going to be hosting a webinar Tuesday, February 1st at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, and it's going to dive into this very deeply. We'll have time for sharing, and we'll do some exercises together around this. You can go to my website, holisticlifenavigation.com, and sign up for it right now. Please go to episode 10 once you find the sensation in you, and give it some time to sit with the episode and see what it feels like with that exercise to find safety in your body while also noticing this part that feels defensive. With SE, somatic experiencing, we never bypass a threat for safety. We're not looking on the bright side of things. We're using safety that exists in our body so we have capacity to be in relationship with these more threatened defensive parts. So when you feel the constriction in your stomach, and then you do the finding safety exercise in episode 10, it's not to ignore the constriction in your stomach. It's to bring the constriction some resource so you can go into the constriction even more. Let it speak to you. Learn what it needs. And let it unfold the way it needs to. Thank you for being part of this session with me today. It felt very beautiful to finally be able to share this with everybody. And I'll look forward to doing more. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. My question for you is, where do you feel the episode? Take a breath and just notice, what's your body doing right now? Sit with it, let it speak to you, and let whatever comes up, come up. And your only job is to listen, for all the wisdom you need is right inside of you. To learn more about my work, you can visit holisticlifenavigation.com and sign up for my mailing list. You'll receive a bi-weekly newsletter with specific monthly topics, free resources, and upcoming events. You can also follow me on Instagram. If you like my podcast, please leave a review and share. 